This week on Arizona Illustrated, labor and the local economy. There's all of these other opportunities out there that they're just not even realizing are there. Kate Meyer, exploring trauma through art. Art is more than just doing a painting or making a pretty picture. It's about concept, it's about message. Restoring pepper sauce. Caves are one of the last places on earth that are really something special, really unexplored. And from the vault. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. With Labor Day just behind us, it's worth noting that the stock market has seen significant gains over the past year and Wall Street is bullish. While on the other hand, worker wages are static and have not kept up with the gains. Education funding in Arizona remains at the bottom of the list and we're in the midst of a severe skilled labor shortage impacting growth trends and vexing economists. What does all this add up to and where do we go from here? The economy's gotten better. There's more work to go around. The problem is there's not enough labor to go around. Jobs aren't finishing on time or on budget. A lot of jobs are being shut down because they can't hire people or get enough people to finish the job. Labor markets are tighter by all accounts. It's in the data. It's certainly in the, in the air when you talk to employers. Talk to several industry partners in many different areas that we represent in the applied technology programs here at Pima Community College. They're all facing shortages. Companies really want to get a hand on our students so they can help fill some of the positions that are right now vacant. Arizona is doing pretty good. We are generating jobs, population, and, inc and income growth at a solid pace, typically above the national average. Last year, Arizona's job growth was 2.4%. National growth was about 1.6%. Arizona's unemployment rates come down significantly. It was 10.4% in 2010 at the peak. It's now 4.9%. There are a lot of reasons for that shortage. We know from a community college standpoint that there's a declining birth rate. So if you've got baby boomers phasing out from employment and a lower rate of high school graduates coming in, We are a contact one call center. Companies outsource us to help, oddly enough, with their labor challenges. It's probably been one of the most difficult times for us as a business to recruit and maintain staff. This is what we have found will help you to be successful here at Contact One. The first one is attendance. The increase in the minimum wage has a huge impact as well. A lot of people are looking for the higher dollar. One of the riddles of this recovery so far has been the slow income growth and relatively slow wage growth. The unemployment rate's relatively low. Nonetheless, we do see wages rising gradually, really across the board. We're raising our starting wages. We offer benefits, health care. After a year or so, many of our employees might be taking advantage of all the bonuses and stuff, 13, 14, in some cases, $15 an hour. Average on a basic laborer, if you know nothing about construction, you can start making $15, $16 an hour. Construction jobs, which just took an incredible hit during the, the Great Recession, have uh, hit bottom in the last year or so. Those construction jobs have been rising at a, at a rapid pace, roughly 10% over the year. With the giant job losses, a lot of construction workers, we think, may have left the state, and the ones that are left have gotten older. Last couple years, average age on a construction site is 52 years old. There's construction going up left and right in Tucson, and if we can't get people to work, then we're not gonna be able to build anything. Workforce development has continued to be pretty much a number one on the list for Arizona Transportation Builders Association. The good part is wages are going up. The bad part is we can't find the people that want to come out and work and find a career in construction. We are lacking skilled labor. We're lacking labor in general. 
there's definitely a stigma about what it is to work in construction. You know, because I oh, construction worker, all oh, you know, people kind of look down on construction workers, but, but I've been very well off working construction. That's what's also kept me working construction. I've been out in the field since 1983. I'm 19. I am not the kind of person that can just sit at a desk. I want to be able to see the progress that I'm making, so working with my hands really helps with that. For a while, I was toying with the idea of going to the U of A for architecture. I decided that PIMA was a bit more cost effective. I could go two years and be specialized in either construction management or carpentry or one of the other construction trades. We've continued to push this four-year route as the best way, the only way, and so there's just a real hazy knowledge or understanding of what's available. And I've heard employers also say that they need to do a better job of explaining the high paying careers that are available. Data from 2016 from the Census Bureau shows that the median earnings for a resident of the state with a bachelor's degree are roughly $23,000 higher than wages for somebody with just a high school education. So that's a huge gap. There are always going to be people for whom college is, is not a great fit. And we need to make sure that they're aware of those job opportunities and the wages that are associated with those jobs. I think that a lot of people my age, they don't really think about there is the ability to go and be a home builder. There is the ability to be an HVAC repairman or installer. There's all of these other opportunities out there that they're just not even realizing are there. Concrete carpentry, electricians, all that, you make real good money, you know, you work your way up. I'm 53 right now, and I'm already looking into retiring, but I'm taking a different course. I'm not saying it's easier, but something that I can fall back on once I retire, to, you know, the HVAC, the air conditioning. Keep looking for more skills more things that, that you know how to do, because one thing that, that I think is clear is that the economy is gonna to continue to change at a rapid pace. Keeping up with that means that we're all gonna be continually trying to learn new things. I think a lot of people felt that people were more expendable, I think, than, than they really are. And today's hiring environment is really proving that. We really do still need people to do the jobs and to do them well. When you want to solve a problem, you don't want to speak to computers. You don't want to leave a voicemail. You want to speak to a real person. The average worker should expect continuing favorable prospects in the, in the labor market. As long as we avoid recession, the bargaining power, I think, will be with workers. It's daunting in the fact that there's so much out there that needs to be done, but it's also reassuring in the job security. There's always going to be that job for you because there's such a need for it. Relationship abuse, sexual harassment and violence, and trauma combine to leave a long-lasting impact on the hearts and minds and bodies of the people who experience them. It is all too common and often hidden from sight. Artist Kate Meyer has made it her work to bring the hidden into view, exploring this difficult topic in her own unique and creative way. I think safety is something that isn't easy to find. Like experiencing true wellness and health and safety isn't something that people get to have very often. I think that when people are trying to create safety, it's a lot of times because they might not even be familiar with what true safety feels like. I am Kate Meyer, and I am an artist. I'm also an activist and community organizer, and I work doing substance misuse prevention with youth and families. For me, 
art is more than just doing a painting or making a pretty picture. It's about concept, it's about message, it's about expressing emotions or expressing experiences. This is both a nest and it's also a neural network. The threads are not on the inside, they're just on the outside branches. And so those represent all kinds of feelings that people who've experienced sexual harassment or sexual assault and trauma go through and experience as they're processing, as they're dealing with those feelings. It's supposed to be kind of like a safe place. I definitely felt safe as a child, most of the time. <laughs> and then, you know, growing up, especially as a girl, people start catcalling or harassing you on the street and you're like 10 and you're like, I'm a child. Why are you yelling at me from out of your car? And then, you know, I went through a lot of years where I felt safe with certain people, friends or family, and not with others who had like significant roles in my life. Um, in my 20s, I had a couple of relationships. And one of them, you know, the person just was constantly berating me um, and being controlling in ways that were, you know, trying to make it seem like I was doing something wrong or I was at fault or I was imperfect or I was to blame. Another relationship in which the threat of physical violence was a constant. Like the fist isn't connecting and so you're not getting hit, but the walls are getting punched and kicked and there's holes and the dishes are getting thrown at you. People think that you know if you're not getting hit or if I'm not getting hit, then I'm not in an abusive relationship. When people are in those kinds of situations, we spend so much time trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Why do I feel depressed? Why do I feel anxiety? Why am I having panic attacks? And we go to doctors and we get medications or we self-medicate. Always trying to figure out what's wrong inside and not fully being able to recognize that it has nothing to do with you. And it's all about the other person. And so for months, I grappled with feeling like I thought I was safe and then I wasn't. And like, how do you actually experience safety and trust safety when it can get taken away from you like that? At times when I felt like I couldn't breathe or my panic level was to a point where I couldn't be in a room or in a building or anywhere, um, I could get in my car and put on music and just go drive for sometimes hours. Um, just felt like, you know, watching all of this stuff go by, but mostly it was about the skies and the mountains and being able to look at stuff that was bigger than myself. have this series of film pieces where paint represents violence. And so in the films, I'm either throwing paint or paint is being thrown on me or people are writing on me with paint. And so in each of those, you know, it's how violence can be perpetrated against you or from you or towards yourself, how it doesn't just stay contained. It, you know, it's messy, it splatters, it gets all over. A lot of times when people think about trauma, they think about a specific isolated incident or someone having to experience extreme violence. But yet, like hate speech or harassment, people touching you inappropriately, someone following you in their car yelling that they're gonna rape you. 
And those things build up over time. You know, you deal with each one as it happens. You know, you cope with it as best you can in the moment, and you move on. But there's, you know, a point at which you realize that you've now experienced and been exposed to sustained traumas over years. For this show, content warning, I'm looking for future places to exhibit it. I've had a lot of people come through who've said, all the lawyers need to see this, or all the students need to see this, or all the whatever category of people they work with should see this. The goal right now is to have that opportunity to have it be more visible. It's really hard to get away from blaming myself for putting myself into specific situations, blaming myself for trusting specific people, blaming myself for making decisions that, in retrospect, weren't great decisions. And so trying to move away from that blame and realize that I didn't actually do anything wrong, that I was spending time with people who I thought were going to take care of me, and they didn't. And that doesn't, that doesn't have to mean that I'm at fault. I can hopefully sooner than later um, stop blaming myself and put the blame on them because that's really where that belongs. Arizona is home to some of the most awe-inspiring natural environments in America. From our diverse deserts to world-famous canyons, high country forests and all points in between, including those below the surface. Like Pepper Sauce Cave, an underground labyrinth of natural beauty 40 miles north of Tucson. And while thousands of visitors practice responsible tourism and adventure each year, there are those who've defaced the site and selfishly left their destructive mark. And there are others who've taken on restoring the cave as their labor of love. This box is going all beyond the rabbit hole. I'm gonna start on uh, drills and uh, grinders. Okay. I'm Ray Keeler. I'm the uh, president of the Central Arizona Grotto. It's the local chapter of the National Speleological Society. We're about cave exploration, conservation, science, and just the better understanding of the caves. Today we are doing, uh, starting a three-day effort Friday is set up, Saturday there'll be about 20 people here uh, all day cleaning tags and Sunday we'll work till noon and then bring all the equipment out of the cave. In we go, let's do it. The sign outside has four rules. No spray paint, pee before you go into the cave, have at least one light per person and then take your trash out with you. The second room was one of the most graffitied rooms in the entire cave. Reds, yellows, greens, blues, blacks, whites, names, symbols. This room here had another 30 to 40 tags on this wall and that wall. There were another 40 or 50 in that passage here. It's a crawl through. So with all the teams working, we just keep progressing into the cave. When we got here, there were five or six 
spray paint tags with lots of uh, colors. We've cleaned those off, 25 or 30 tags on this side that went clear in here, through, back into this passage, and then another 50 scratches along this wall. It was bad. And we've cleaned it all out. That was three people for three hours to do this. Somebody wants to leave their mark, same as 40,000 years ago, only they have spray paint and stable lights. This is flat out unnecessary vandalism. The draw for me is, is the work. I do a lot of conservation work. This isn't the only cave I do. It's tough when you gotta clean up on other people's stuff. It's bad enough to clean up our own stuff. And we try to be very, very careful when we're caving so we don't leave even breadcrumbs on the ground. So then to have to do it for other people, you know, it's, it's tough, but uh, it's what we do because we want to keep our environment. I participate in this project because I think caves are one of the last places on earth that are really something special, really unexplored, something that most people never get a chance to see anything so out of the ordinary. And this cave, it's great because it's really accessible. A lot of people from Tucson, from all over the place can come here and really see what caving is all about. But unfortunately, you know, over the years, people have decided to vandalize it. We put in reflective arrows so you can see one to the next. And if you miss that one, we've got another one pointing to the right. So this one's pointing down underneath and that one's to the right. The idea is to make sure people can get out the easiest way of the cave. People were putting in arrows themselves. Some people marked their arrows going into the cave. We went this way. Instead, some people mark the arrows going the opposite direction. So sometimes the arrows are pointing in, some are pointing out. So now they're doing multiple tags, multiple arrows with different colors, so you have your own color. We've solved all that. We've made it easier. There's no need for it anymore. I'm from New York City. I live in Harlem. Um, I'm here with uh, some family friends. They took me to uh, the cave and I guess is the word spelunking? Because we're, we're going around in the cave and we're just climbing all through and exploring everything. It's been completely amazing. I have never done anything like this before and I had no idea what to expect. It's been a lot of fun. I really think like things like this, um, like volunteer work for like natural areas are just like phenomenal people. Um, and you know, someone's gotta do it. And it's, it's grueling work and it's, I, I respect people that, that uh, take their time to do that. We enjoy caves, so this is just our way of paying back to the community and to the Forest Service for allowing us the opportunity to go into caves. Solvent drill, solvent drill, brush, 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 solvent, and we got it to a point where it's can mud it over, but. Unless you literally go behind the formation and put your head down or just look at the water, you don't realize there's air blowing out. Like you're <laughs> you bleed, you sweat, you get dust everywhere and like or mud and just like you have good times and you have bad times, but at the end you come out and you laugh and you just like, this is what we did. Like we did this. Cavers, we do this on our spare time. We're all volunteers. None of us get paid. Well, the reason we're doing this is because people go through the cave and they say, somebody should take care of that graffiti. Somebody should do some of that. And we decided we were going to be the somebody. The history of labor unions in Arizona is complicated, and the Grand Canyon State remains a right-to-work state, with political opposition and legislation limiting labor's influence. Here's a look back at 1983, when more than 1,000 union members took to the streets of Tucson in this week's From the Vault. 
Since 1894, when Grover Cleveland was president, Labor Day has been a holiday honoring working people. And today in Tucson, the working people marched. Over 3,500 trade union members, their families and allies, paraded as part of a nationwide celebration of Solidarity Day. Darwin Acock of the Arizona AFL-CIO explained this was strictly an American Union activity. This is established for us here in the United States of America to draw the union people, the working people together, and this is Labor Day and this is what this is all about. In past weeks, Arizona has received nationwide attention as a result of union strikes against the Phelps Dodge Corporation. Today, many marchers held that issue as the focus of their participation. With any kind of luck, and a lot of prayer will pull through with it because okay. Phelps Dodge isn't really trying to help the unions. Across America, we will be heard. That's the theme of 1983 Solidarity Events. The motto was originated by the AFL-CIO in September 1981 when over 400,000 workers gathered in Washington for the first Solidarity Day. What about the state of the country right now in terms of the union movement? Is this a good time or a bad time? It's a bad time for all working people, whether they're in unions or out of unions, uh, because of the economy. There are 10 million men and women without work this morning. In a recent letter to trade unionists, AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland said Solidarity Day was not to be a day for partisan politics. This morning in Tucson, Senator Dennis DeConcini hit hard at the Reagan administration, and then he ended his address with a call to action. This Labor Day celebration is the appropriate time for us to renew our commitment to the working men and women of this country. It is the time for us to recall that this nation was built on your hard labor, a time to renew our commitment to a decent and just society, a time to renew the society of opportunity, the society of compassion, and the society of excellence. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.